Uh, welcome to uh, a lecture on Japanese art after 1300. Uh, and we're going to see five uh, slides of the most interesting Japanese works of art from the last several centuries uh, tonight. Uh, we've uh, already covered Chinese art, and this is the second half of the lecture uh, for, of course, Art 1.2, uh, Week 8, okay? And uh, it will be posted on YouTube uh, by 7 p.m. on Friday, if not before that, or certainly, let's say by 8, because it can take a while for it to process. Certainly after 8 p.m. Friday, if you hadn't already seen this lecture, I'll send you an email, you can watch it, okay? It's the second half of the week eight lecture. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about Japan. And I always like to start with a little context. So let's start with the fact that Japan is roughly the size of California, but it has about 130 million people or close to that. And so with California, we have about 40 million people. So again, it's not complex mathematics or high algebra, it's simple arithmetic. Uh, that means Japan is more than three times as crowded as California. Um, but the main thing about Japan that it makes it so distinctive, its art and its you know, cultural heritage, is that even though obviously it's one of the most influential countries in all of the world, really, but certainly in Asia, uh, it's often overshadowed in people's minds by the nearby giant neighbor of China, but there's very distinct differences between their artistic traditions is what we're going to talk about. So if you see the two lectures back to back, as was the case on the night that I gave these lectures, this is a makeup for the fact the second half, one of my students pointed out, didn't get recorded the, the, the night I gave that lecture. So it'll therefore be, you know, available for you as a separate file but you should see them back to back because there's points of reference and comparison between the lecture I gave for week eight on Chinese art, which I will post about by that same time, 8 p.m. on uh, <clears throat> this Friday, March 19th. And then watch right after that, uh, if your schedule permits, the one on this one on Japanese art. Okay, uh, so Japan has a long and um, very distinctive uh, history of having been ice or because some people would say because it was somewhat of an ice or very much actually an isolated uh, society for centuries uh, there was some trade and there were some missionaries from europe allowed in in the 15 and early 1600s and then they were uh, booted out by the emperor after, I don't know, several generations. And there were not many of them to begin with anyway. So then there was a period of about, oh, 150, 200 years of total isolation from almost the entire developed world uh, until some of you may know, an American Admiral Perry was his name, left from Vallejo, yes, right here in the Bay Area. Commodore Perry, actually the Commodore, uh, in a naval, um, I guess you could say mission to Japan. And after meeting there with the emperor and the other officials at the top of Japanese society, the Japanese government decided to open up to the world. And that was in like 1854. So it's not that long ago. All right, so let's get started with the first must know slide from tonight. Okay. So uh, let's hide this thumbnail and get this to full screen. Okay, uh, this is the first must know from the syllabus. And the title of this one is Flowers, plural, Flowers of Beauty in the Floating World. Location, of course, Japan and the date 1769. 
there's several things to say about this, but let's start with the fact that uh, these two young women, one is clearly, you know, an adolescent, probably even 12 or so, and the other is a young adult, are sitting uh, in a room overlooking the harbor of what's now Tokyo. But at that time, the name Tokyo wasn't used for that city, which you may know Tokyo is the largest city in the world. If you didn't know, it's about like 35 million people in greater Tokyo. Um, so back then it was called Edo, E-D-O. So this is from the Edo period of Japanese art. When Tokyo, uh, Stockstead mentioned this, so it gets one fact slightly incorrect, it was, uh, one of the two, I think she says the largest city in the world, it was one of only two cities to have over a million people by the late 18th century. The other one was London. London certainly had a million people by the end of the, the 18th century, the late 1700s. <clears throat> so again, Tokyo back then was called Edo, capital E-D-O, and it was one of the two only two cities in the world with over a million people. And it was an golden age or a golden age for uh, various types of art, especially for printmaking in Japan. And we'll see evidence of that a couple of, with a couple of these slides tonight, starting with this one. So what, what are we seeing here? We're seeing a courtesan slash prostitute. And unfortunately, at least in my mind, a, a young protege of hers who's being groomed to do the same work. Uh, in a brothel. And why this was not controversial at the time for Japanese uh, viewers of this kind of art or, or, or you know, artists to create and, and the Japanese society standards was because of something called yukio. So let's do that. That's the um, main definition for this lecture. It's on your list of terms to know, so you should already have it there, right? Yukio, U Y, sorry, Y U K I O hyphen capital E. What does that mean? Well, here's the definition. Yukio means literally images of the floating world, comma, which symbolize that life is short. So we should all enjoy the pleasures of life while we're alive. It's that simple, very straightforward. Uh, Yukio translates to uh, images of the floating worlds, which symbolize that life is short, so we should all enjoy the pleasures of this life while we're alive. Well, that would mean that they openly accepted and patronized Japanese who could afford it, you know, probably mostly middle class and of course upper class citizens, especially in a big city which is quite prosperous, like, like uh, Edo. Uh, things like theaters, restaurants, uh, sporting events, and brothels, and they were all legal and all considered acceptable. So that's why this would not have been a controversial image at that time in Japan. So she, the younger one, the protege, if you could use that word, is, is of course uh, using a telescope to look out at ships in the harbor. But this is a classic example of Japanese printmaking. That's the other part of the meaning, which is that certain techniques were invented by Japanese printmakers during the 18th century and reached uh, a zenith of uh, popularity in the next century, the 19th century. We'll see evidence of that on the, the last slide we covered tonight. The Great Way by uh, Hokusai. Uh, so in the 18th and 19th century, you know, from around the early 1700s to the late 1800s, uh, these techniques were, were um, signature motifs, you know, typical of Japanese printmaking, and they were then imitated by Western artists all over the world, but especially <coughs> in Europe including Van Gogh and, and others uh, <clears throat> of the late 1800s, as well as in, in the United States. <clears throat> in other words, these prints made their way around the world that influenced Western art. Okay, here are these uh, main features that uh, you can see clearly in this. First of all, it's the oblique angle. Every, at least of the famous ones anyway, that, that uh, were very popular and reproduced. These are reproduced, of course. Um, 
in, in quantities, at least several hundred, if not thousands. So every one of the more popular ones I've ever seen has the oblique angle, which is another way of saying a sharp diagonal perspective. I mean, that's not what normally you would see in a painting. But if you notice, when you look at Impressionist art, we're going to cover that toward the end of the semester, uh, you'll see a lot of the Impressionist painters adopting the same perspective, which they were clearly directly influenced by Japanese prints in doing so. So we have the oblique angle, sharp diagonal. And then we have the bold outlines around the main objects. You see that here around the window seat and uh, the clothing here, the robes of the two uh, women. Um, and then we also have uh, an emphasis, you could say, on or use of uh, rich geometric patterns in the main objects. And you see that here in the robes of the two young women, mostly. Uh, there's, to a lesser degree, there's some with the lettering here, and I, it's not been translated in uh, stock set, so I'm not sure what that says, but I'm sure it has something to do with this, you know, brothel that this was uh, illustrating. Might even be a, an advertisement. Uh, Stockstead didn't mention it the last time I read it, whether that was the purpose of this, but it could have been. In any case, so you have all three of those features here, uh, and they're classically um, typical Japanese printmaking techniques. Okay, so that's the meaning. The formal analysis is balanced, I would say, with the uh, largest of the two female, the larger of the two female figures right in the middle and uh, an equal number of, um, you know, window framing, I guess you could call them, right? Uh, you know, obviously that's wood, that's not obvious, uh, on either side of, of the two figures. Um, so it's roughly balanced. And the area of the floor and the area of the water outside is, is, is almost equal. Top to bottom is also roughly balanced. Then the rhythm is obvious with their heads, hands, the clothing, the ships in the harbor, uh, the window framing and so forth. So quite a bit of, of, of a strong rhythm and that's typical also of Japanese printmaking, but that's not unique to Japanese printmaking, of course. And then we have simulated texture. Yeah, there is actually on this little potted plant, on their hair, I would say on their robes to a lesser extent on the window seat, which is almost certainly wood, and maybe at least the largest boat. Not so much on the rest of the landscape, or a seascape, I should say, but uh, behind or out, out of the window there, it's not so uh, well defined in terms of simulated textures. It's mostly on the foreground. And there is little modeling, very little, but there is some on the bottom of the window seat, right? Makes this look darker than the part they're sitting on. Uh, and I think that's really about it. Uh, it may be on, yeah, a little on the uh, stem, I guess it is, or trunk. Of, <laughs> I mean, it's a stem, right, of a potted plant. But that's minimal. And that's also typical of Japanese prints. Again, that's not unique to Japanese art, but that they usually didn't use a lot of modeling. Uh, and then we have it stable. Most of you might think it's dynamic. And in a way, it is because of the oblique angle. So you could say, well, that makes it, by definition, at least somewhat or heavily dynamic, and that's true. But the actual individual lines and objects, her body, right angle, definitely, you know, the entire pose, and then the young protege next to her, the window framing, um, the lines on the, of course, uh, uh, window seat, it's more stable than dynamic. The largest mass, that's pretty easy. It's the uh, older woman, and then I'd say it's the window seat and then the younger woman. Uh, for space, you, I, there isn't uh, foreshortening here. In fact, if anything, it's almost the reverse of that. If we were using, seeing this as using foreshortening would be narrower on this end, further away from us, it's not. So really all there is here is overlapping and diminishing size, of course, the boats in the, in the harbor. There's bold outline around the two main figures in the window seat, thin outlines, uh, on the boats, pretty much. Although this one has some bold, but some of the boats are thinner and the water itself. But most of the lines are bold. The colors are warm, of course, on her, most of her robes, a little bit cool on the sash here. And the same here with this younger woman and a little bit cool on the 
green dirt or, or uh, soil that's in that potted plant. But everything else is either neutral, as you can see in the water, that's just black over off, or kind of an off white color, which is faded, so it looks maybe a bit tan, but it would, would have been an off white originally. So most of the colors are warm on the two um, human figures and uh, the boat, the largest boat and cool or neutral on the other objects. Okay. Um, so let's move on now. This is the next must know. And it's two words, Himeji Castle, H-I-M-E-J-I Castle. The location is a city in Japan. It's Osaka, O-S-A-K-A, -A, 1609. This is from the era of the warlords, uh, during which uh, various armies, mercenaries, what they were, hired, right, uh, uh, military forces, right, were working for different warlords throughout Japan and waging war against each other, against the rival warlords army. So as you could imagine, that led to, created, I should say, a period of, of great uh, turmoil and uh, suffering and uh, of course, violence and uh, hardship, mostly economic and sometimes physical hardship for the general population. The civilians were caught in the middle so it's a period that just generally seem, is referred to, some say the word shogun era, that was the Japanese word for uh, S-H-O-G-U-N, I believe it is, for these uh, warlords uh, and uh, or their commanders. So this is a castle of one of the warlords in which he was able to not only defend himself with his soldiers, but uh, was able to fend off any uh, enemy who tried to attack it. It was never conquered, and that's one reason it's still there. These are rare, these multi-tiered um, castles. There are only a, a few of them in Japan that are still standing intact from that period. After all, this is over 400 years old, and it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Now, some of you may remember from, if you've watched the China portion of this lecture before this, the word pagoda, right? This is not a temple, so it doesn't qualify as, as a pagoda, but it does have the same wide overhanging roof lines. The right word is eaves, but you don't have to know that word. Uh, wide overhanging roof lines with projecting wood balcony. So it's, it's styled the, the shape of the, the, the structure itself with the multi-tiers and the overhanging roof lines on pagoda style architecture, but is not a pagoda because it's not a temple. Um, okay, and so what uh, other uh, or specifically, I should say, what, what techniques did this warlord use besides having a rather forbidding looking multi-story building to uh, deter enemies from attacking? Well, they did attack. They tried, I'm sure, multiple times, but they never succeeded because of the uh, approaches being limited to very narrow footpaths, which meant that at least for, if not all of the route from below up to the entrance of this castle, any attacker would have to approach in single file. And of course that reduces your advantage if you've got you know hundreds of men or more attacking a castle and you can only come up to the, the entrance one at a time. And then also, of course, you can imagine by this time they had gunpowder and rifles, certainly in, in Japan, um, that there were our, um, artillery, of course, somewhat uh, behind some of these windows, but mostly it would have been archers, bows and arrows, and uh, riflemen who could, of course, pick off the approaching soldiers. So this castle was extremely well defended and was one of those uh, that, like I said, was never successfully uh, assaulted by uh, any enemy. In, in the warlord era. And then it became a national historic landmark. It's, it's I'm sure open to the public as a museum today. Okay, so that's the meaning. The formal analysis, if, it's, if you stand right in front of it, it is completely balanced left to right as most of these uh, 
either true pagodas or pagoda-like structures like this castle would, would be balanced that way, uh, phys you know, visually and physically from left to right, but obviously it's unbalanced or weighted toward the bottom. For space, you've got, if you count this as the foundation, then that's not the first level. So one, two, three, four, five levels, or you could say six if you count the foundation. Uh, so it's a multi-tiered five or six level structure uh, with uh, e it, which each floor gets, after the first two, the floors get smaller as they go up to the top. You don't have to know the exact dimensions, but you should probably mention that it reaches a total height of nearly 100 feet. I think it's like 90 or something from the foundation line to the top of the upper level is, uh, you can say, about or nearly 100 feet. Okay, and then the color is cool on most of it. This, this is that classic blue ceramic roof tile that the Japanese prefer. Uh, I don't know why, but they don't rarely see, uh, never seen many pictures of Japanese buildings with red clay tile like most of the rest of the world would use. They, they like the blue colored tiles. So that's cool. And obviously the walls are off white, except for the foundation, that level. Obviously that's stone and those are warm colors. And that, of course, uh, brings up texture. That's a real rough texture of stone along the foundation and all the other textures are real smooth textures, real smooth plaster. Uh, probably over stone, or it's hard to say, but it could be even concrete. Uh, but plaster is the exterior material. So real smooth plaster, real smooth tiles, and real smooth glass in the windows are the other textures. There's no similar textures here. Uh, the largest mass, well, that would be the first three levels. They're all about the same size, right? If you include the foundation, the first three levels are about the same. And then of course, obviously the second largest would be the next level up and so on until the smallest at the top. There's no modeling here except the shadows from the sun. There's no lines that you can see here. They're just visual lines, uh, which of course are at the corners and around the, the windows. Uh, and then we have, um, <clears throat> it's, it's stable and dynamic. It's stable at each corner, of course, right, uh, uh, all the way up, but the roof lines are clearly dynamic. And then the windows, of course, are also stable. Okay. And the rhythm is a, is a repeated shapes of the overhanging uh, roof lines and, and brackets and the windows. All right. This is the next uh, snow. And uh, this is um, Fusuma, F-U-S-U-M-A, is the name of this. Uh, it's actually a room in a much larger house, which is now on display, as I understood it. I'm pretty sure this is right, uh, to the public as a museum of a very historic site. But the main point is it's classically Japanese uh, interior architecture, a classic example of Japanese interior architecture. We're going to talk about what that means in a minute. Once again, the title or name of this uh, space is Fusuma, F-U-S-U-M-A. The architect, we know his name was Itoko, E-I-T-O-K-U, 1573. So you see it's what, uh, almost 450 years old. So what do we see here? We see a room that's for uh, Multi-purpose is really the concept. Now, the Japanese were way ahead of Western architecture when it came to practicality and simplicity of design. There's a phrase now, I, I hear it all the time, my wife's one of my favorite shows that I watch where they're sometimes on HGTV, House Hunters International, and almost every couple says they want open concept. Uh, I hear that phrase much more, I'm gonna burst. Yeah, it's the rage now. Well. That was first used in America after Japanese architects introduced the concept at the World's Fair of Chicago in 1893. There's no debating that. The first time most Americans saw open concept, quote unquote, because remember with Victorians, if you've never lived in one, you've seen a, you know, photos of them or, or you know, uh, know maybe people who live in one, Victorians, at least if they have the original floor plan, are not open concept. 
the rooms are all divided off and uh, quite cluttered and even somewhat dark. Uh, you know, of course, if you open all the, the windows, they are less dark, but they, they're not known for their open, uh, free flowing floor plan. That's a phrase you should use in your notes. This is an example of one of the earliest designs to use this Japanese concept of an open floor plan or free flowing floor plan. That's actually the word I think that the most architects would use today. And that concept inspired every major American architect who um, is considered the early, mo or are considered part of the early modern movement. Frank Lloyd Wright, Lewis Sullivan, Julia Morgan, right? The first woman architect with her own practice. And uh, Bernard Maybeck, the father of uh, green design in America, right here from the Bay Area, in fact. Uh, they all were inspired by the exhibit of Japanese uh, architecture that they saw at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And they said so openly. And then they would travel to Japan, all of them did, uh, to see actual Japanese architecture. So what are the features then to define this uh, style? Uh, well, first of all, the walls are made of shoji screens. Shoji is S-H-O-J-I. Those are thin Rice, it's not a definition, it's just part of the meaning of this slide. Thin rice paper, right? Partitions that are movable and can be used to either close off a room or open it up. You can see how that would work. Uh, these these uh, partitions can be moved, you know, sl sliding most of the time. The ones I've seen are sliding. Uh, they might open up, you know, in and out like a door. Either way though, they, they, they are movable. And they could obviously, therefore, if they were, you know, all open at the same time on one wall, you opened up this room to a much larger space. But the room itself already has that rather large, open, again, free-flowing floor plan or open concept. Then the other uh, traditional Japanese feature that's hundreds of years old and, again, imitated in this country after about 1890 is the simplicity of the designs. There are no decorations above the uh, framing level here. There are on these uh, panels of soji panels here because this particular architect was asked by the uh, client to put some landscapes. Let's go up and see close, you know, classic traditional Japanese landscapes. That's one thing they're very similar to Chinese art in that regard, uh, you know, with plants and rocks and, and birds and things like that, you know, scenes from nature. That's just the preference of this particular client, but many of the time, most of these didn't have any decoration on the shoji screens or in the upper walls, and this doesn't have any above the screens. That's un totally unheard of. In Victorian architecture, every room is decorated with something on the ceiling, on the walls, and around the fireplaces. So obviously, this is much more, and again, simple, clean lines is the phrase that often used the, the Japanese uh, architects, uh, domestic, we're talking about interior design for residences. Uh, were, were the first to use that hundreds of years ago. And then the third thing is the open use of the materials. The materials are not disguised like they would be in Victorian architecture, uh, you know, painted or gilded or what. They are um, just the natural wood and plaster here on the walls and on the, on the roof. So you, you see how that really is ahead of its time. Now, this last part of the meaning is what was this room used for? I said multi-purposes would it be there's a Japanese tea ceremony that would have been conducted by the family that lived there and maybe certain invited guests at regular uh, intervals, I don't know, once a week, maybe one day a week. Uh, dinners, including, uh, you know, guests coming to visit for dinner. Uh, audiences with uh, important officials. This person, whoever he was, was wealthy and well-connected, whoever had this house built. So he might or might not have even hired people uh, for government positions uh, and interviewed them here. Uh, and then uh, various other kinds of public events, uh, you know, such as receptions, um, weddings perhaps, or at least, you know, some, some kind of engagement parties, things like that. In other words, family uh, and group oriented events, and social events, uh, even music performances, you know, traditional Japanese, uh, instruments played while people sat quietly on these mats. <laughs> these mats are new, of course, but there would have been something similar even 
in the 1500s and listen to the music. So this is a, literally a multi-purpose um, recreational dining slash entertainment space. Okay, that's the meaning. Formal analysis, completely balanced, totally symmetrical, as you might expect, even though you can't see all four, four sides here, they're, they're totally uh, even on each side. So it is balanced top to bottom too, not just left to right on each wall, of course, because the size of the roof is equal to the size of the floor, obviously. Um, all right, and then we have the rhythm of the partitions themselves, the wood framing, right, of the walls, and then the open beam ceiling. The painting on the screens is not really part of the architecture, but if you want to count that, of course, that creates rhythm as well. Color is mostly warm, except for the cool uh, uh, white uh, plaster, and that's plaster painted, of course, plaster in between the framing on the upper walls. So there is some cool area, but most of the, you know, the exposed wooden beams everywhere in the framing and the shoji screens in this case, of course, are, are tinted uh, tannish color. So that makes most of this room warm. Um, there is the rhythm of the framing, the beam ceiling. And of course, in this case, each of these panels are the same size and shape. Uh, and then, uh, well, at least they are right in the same overall sections. And here they're, they're narrow because it's probably the entrance of the room. Um, in any case, you, you have plenty of <clears throat> shapes, repeated rectangles and, and uh, beams and so forth, lots of rhythm. Um, and then it is almost entirely stable, this room. I mean, the only things dynamic are the paintings on the walls. Everything else is straight lines. The largest mass will, by a bit, it would be the roof because the roof is, uh, has the open beaming and it. it does kind of create a slight uh, you know, cove effect. Some people would call it cathedral ceiling, but that's too strong of a term. It's not meant to imitate a cathedral or church here. But it does rise up to a, a ridge in the middle. And so there's a little more wood framing on the roof than there is wood uh, on the floor. So you can say the largest mass is the ceiling and then the floor and then the uh, longer walls, which would be the ones on this side to the left and the far right, you can't see, of course, on the opposite side of the room. <clears throat> okay, um, and there's some modeling. It's just, you know, it would be shadows if there were any, but there aren't here from the sun. Like I said, I believe there's a museum, so the lighting would be artificial. But even when it was in the uh, sunlight, it would just be a little bit of natural shadows, no technique for modeling unless you count the painting on the walls. And then that would be to lead to the last thing. Line here is mostly visual, as it usually is in architecture on the framing here and the beaming, but there is painted line on these screens. Okay. Now we're going to skip this because it's not, uh, I've decided it's not going to be on the um, final. It's a lacquer box, okay. Uh, and so you don't need to know the details. It's, it's in stock if you want to read about it. But let's move on to the next must know, which is this one. Otani Oniji acting. That's O-T-A-N-I and then O-N-I-J-I. -I. Otani Oniji acting is the title. The artist's name we have is, his last name is Sharaku. S H A R A K U, Sharaku, 1794. Well, based on just the date and what I told you with the first uh, must know slide of the um, um, flowers, right, of beauty in the floating world, you might guess that this is part of the uh, Yuki O uh, culture and tradition in ja Japanese art. It absolutely is. Uh, I said, you know, there were several types, right, of um, uh, public entertainment that Japanese who could afford it during the Edo period, and that's when this is, this is from the Edo period, would have, uh, you know, frequented and enjoyed. And one of those was uh, theater. They had a very rich tradition. And I don't know if anybody here has ever heard of Kabuki theater, but I grew up in a uh, part of Chicago where I think there was a local Kabuki theater. Not Well, it wasn't right near where we live, but 
not too far away. And then downtown Chicago, there was a couple where the actors portrayed roles in a similar manner. And so we're going to describe what that is. But th that's important, though, the first part of the meaning that this is from the Edo period. An example of the Yukio, I already defined what that is, Yukio philosophy, and people were enjoying these plays along with a meal and maybe a visit to the local problem before or after the theater. Um, in any case, this is one of the most famous actors on the stage at this time in Japan. And this may well be, uh, you know, an advertisement. It probably is for this actor. Uh, but this kind of uh, performance was always deliberately exaggerated. You can see by the expression on his face, the exaggeration in his eyes and his mouth, and even his, his pose, the way his fingers are projecting out like that, you know, in a very unnatural kind of a position. That's deliberate. That's part of the philosophy of, of Kabuki theater that, uh, after all, if you know some of you silent movies, the actors always had to over, some we would today say, look like they overacted. Well, they had to because there wasn't any sound. So, of course, to get across certain emotions, they had to show only visual cues. And so, for whatever reason, the Japanese Kabuki theater tradition developed with a similar concept that the actors on stage would exaggerate their emotions and their movements throughout any play. And so this is one of the most famous and popular of all of those actors. And it is, again, a classic example of the Yukio uh, concept or philosophy and uh, the art that came with it. It's almost certainly his name here in Japanese. And like I said, it's probably used as an advertisement for that theater or for this actor himself um, and or both. Okay, that's pretty much the whole meaning uh, for this particular uh, <clears throat> slide. So let's do the formal analysis and then we'll get to the last and most important slide for the Japanese slides tonight. And uh, that will be the last one we'll do, the fifth one. Okay, for this one, we have some similar texture, mostly limited to, sorry, to his face and head, his eyebrows to some degree, a little bit in his eyes, certainly his hair is, but I don't see similar texture on his clothing or his hands, not much. There is bold outline on his face, no question, around his eyes, eyebrows, his mouth, uh, but mostly thin outline everywhere else on the clothing and the hands. Uh, it's a, a single mass, the only technique for space is the overlapping of his clothes, of course, over his shoulders and the rest of his body. Um, it is mostly dynamic because he's leaning forward, even though his head itself would be considered mostly stable, just the position of his head. But with, you know, the, the um, tilting pose he's in and his fingers out like that, and uh, of course, the, you know, bottom of his chin jutting out, it, it's more dynamic than stable. And uh, there is no modeling. I don't really see any. Some people might think this is modeling, but those are really more similar texture details, which are achieved with line. The line is bold, as I said earlier, just a moment ago, I should say, uh, on much of the face. But even there, the ear and chin is, is, is uh, thin. So most of the lines here are thin, except the round parts of his face. Uh, and then we have, um, Balance, well, I think it is. It depends on where you draw the line, but if you draw the line this way, roughly equal areas of, on either side of his body, and top to bottom, again, depending on where you draw the line. If it's below his chin, I would say that's a roughly equal balance. Um, and there's the rhythm of the, the fingers, and of course the eyes and eyebrows, and some of the patterns on his clothing. And the colors are warm on his skin, neutral on his hair, and again, a mixture of warm and cool on his clothing, uh, the outer garments there, and uh, the inner garments, a mixture of red, of course, warm and green. Okay. So now we get to the most important slide of this evening, and I'm going to spend... Uh, uh, a little more time on this. It, I'm just going to tell you now, definitely is not going to be cut from the study list. I should have said that with the very first slide, too. I apologize. This is the very first and the very last classic Japanese prince style art. Uh, the um, flowers of beauty and floating world in this one are two that are, you guarantee will not be cut from the study list and have a high possibility. This one even more 
of probability even of being on the final. So make sure you take very thorough notes and uh, study them carefully uh, before the final exam. Okay, so this is so famous that some of you already know a little bit about it or maybe even quite a bit, but we're gonna talk about why it's so famous and what it is about it that people respond to uh, after almost 200 years. The Great Wave, just like it sounds, three words, The Great Wave. The artist's name is Hokusai, H-O-K-U-S-A-I. 1831. Hokusai was by far the most famous, you could say successful, and therefore influential because of his success. Of all the Japanese uh, print makers, that sounds like a production office, I should say artists, period. Japanese graphic artists, you could say it that way, because these were mass produced in books that were sold in uh, sets of dozens of his uh, they're mostly woodblock, as I recall, but in case you can say prints, and they had themes. And this is from one that's, um, whatever the number was, it was dozens in each book. Let's say, you know, uh, 50 views of Mount Fuji. I think it's not the exact title because I don't remember the number, but what matters is to know that that's how he marketed his work. And that's one reason it became so successful is he was able to reach a mass audience. But another reason is his distinctive very evocative style in which he gave almost an emotional, in fact, I would even say living quality to inanimate objects in his prints in a way few other artists ever even attempted, uh, let alone achieved. And because of that, uh, once Japan opened up, you know, after about 1850 or so, to the Western world, those prints, those books and collections of prints made their way around the world and influenced a whole generation or several actually, but certainly the first generation influence were the early impressionists in Europe, particularly in France, of course. Van Gogh was, he wasn't an impressionist, but we will talk about that later. But anyway, the point is impressionist and post-impressionist. So that's the whole last half of roughly, or mo almost the entire last half of the 19th century of European art was influenced, many of the most famous, not all of them, of the artists of that period, the late 19th century, were directly influenced by Hokusai and these prints. This one became the most popular, and I think I can see and say why because here you have mount fuji in the distance even though that's part of the, supposed to be the main part of the theme it's really not it's this wave which is not only a monstrous like some of the waves off the coast of california i was seeing on the news it's over 100 feet high and yet surfers still go out there risking their lives to ride those things it looks like it could easily get close to 100 feet anyway this monster wave the great wave has almost a living quality look at this uh, the set of, they almost look like hands, right? Or claws kind of reaching out to what? Ensnare these hapless <laughs> boaters here down these, uh, or sailors, whatever they are. This, it's hard to tell. They don't look like they're military. But anyway, the, the passengers on these boats are at the mercy, of course, of nature. And at this moment of this particular wave, they may or may not survive the impact. Um, it evokes powerful emotions. And of course, like I said, the uh, concept of having, you know, some living quality, like a living thing in nature, which after all is what many religions throughout human history have believed and not just living, uh, uh, you know, creatures, human and animal, um, are, you know, have spirits, right? or souls, whatever word you want to use, but, but inanimate objects do too. So he kind of evokes that here with this. And then it's the composition. And we're still on the meaning now. We'll do the formal analysis in just a few minutes and wrap it up. Uh, the way he creates this overwhelming dynamic, and it is obviously, this whole bird is dynamic. We'll, we'll say why in a few minutes, uh, of this wave. And then we have this one rising here, right? Which may or may not have just crested. It looks like it did. And this is the next wave. And the uh, rhythm is just really evocative, and powerful. You see the same basic shape in the distance on land with the cone. By the way, if you didn't know, this is an extinct, I believe it's an extinct volcano, Fuji. I think it's the tallest mountain in Japan, pretty sure. It can be seen from the ocean on a clear day. 
so you have the same you know shapes and then the two boats and the curves of the of the surface of the, of the uh, water the the rhythms are just very powerful and that's part of his style uh, and then he chose the colors so carefully too the cold forbidding dark and lighter blue shades with white frost frosty kind of uh, you know, on the top of the foam of course is what it is of these waves um, really hits home right with the power and force overwhelming force of course irresistible if you will of nature in a situation this is obviously a storm let's see okay i think that's plenty on the meaning so now let's wrap it up with uh, formal analysis and we'll call it an, uh, the night. Uh, the largest mass is this wave, if you count as a separate mass. And then I guess the other one that's nearby the, that crested, and then the nearest bow to us, and then the fourth largest would be this uh, further away boat, and then Mount Fuji. Uh, there is modeling here because of the difference in the lighting uh, or the shades, I should say, of, of blue that are used on the underside of the wave, and even here on the curling, you know, claw like. Um, parts of the top of the wave there. So there is modeling, but there isn't, it isn't super realistic. In fact, it's minimal on the boats. It's just a little bit, I guess, from the difference between the sides of the boats, or this one at least, on just this one. Yeah, you don't see any on there, and not on Mount Fuji. So there isn't a lot of modeling, but it's not minimal. It's important. It's on the waves, which is where you want your focus to be. Okay, and then I already mentioned the rhythm. That's obvious with the shapes of the waves and individual fingers, if you will call them that, the crests there uh, of, of the great wave and what's left of this one that's already crashed. And then of course the, the boats and the people in them are obviously repeated shapes. Um, the cement texture is actually quite good. It's not super sharp on the waves. Instead, it's, it's stylized, it's simplified, but it evokes the feeling of what, uh, you know, a, a great large wave like this would, would uh, B, you know, and so of course it does have semi textures on the water <clears throat> and on the boats. And to some degree, I would say on Mount Fuji, because that's snow on top of the mountain there. So there is some similar texture and it's it's fairly uh, <clears throat> well done, though not as detailed as a Western painting would be. And the lines are almost all bold. Now this doesn't have an oblique angle because he wasn't in this case, he's not trying to create the image uh, or impression of an interior space in a room or a view from a room like that first slide we saw. So th there's no real need to do that. But he did use the oblique angle a lot. But he did use traditional techniques here with the, of, of all Japanese printmaking. Remember, they include, right, uh, geometric decorative that's clearly what's going on here. Patterns repeated here on the edges of these two waves, the one that's about to crash and the one that's already uh, <clears throat> come. Uh, and then we have the bold outline. Those two things he used consistently throughout all the prints he made in each of his series. Okay, and then it's totally dynamic. There isn't a straight line in it. Uh, and then the colors are cool, aren't they? Uh, white and blue, except on the boats, there's a hint, but they look more gray to me. I have actually one or two versions of this. They, the boats look like they had tan colors. So let's get up close. Mm, that's borderline. It's almost all cool, except for the sky. Yeah. So everything in the water, uh, boats and waves, and Mount Fuji uh, are cool shades, of course, of different <clears throat> blue, <coughs> excuse me, and off white or just white and blue shades of blue, uh, except there's a little bit in the sky here of a warm on the horizon. For space, you have probably no scientific perspective. He would have been aware of it by this time, the Japanese artists were. It's hard to say if there's a vanishing point. I don't really see evidence of it, but there is foreshortening. There's foreshortening on the boats. Obviously, there's overlapping and diminishing size. So the waves and the, the second boat get smaller as they further away from us. Okay, and is it balanced? No, it's definitely deliberately not balanced. It's weighted or unbalanced clearly both towards the left where the wave is coming from and towards the bottom with the heaving seas below. Okay, um, let's see, texture modeling, balanced rhythm. 
I think we've covered everything. Okay, so remember that this uh, is a very high probability of being on the uh, final, so do study it carefully. Uh, and don't forget, you can always look at, again, any of the lectures, including this one, which it will be posted along with the one uh, on the first half of week eight on Chinese art by, let's say, to be safe, 8 p.m. on Friday, this Friday, um, March 19th. Okay, thank you all. I hope for those of you who watch this or will watch it. Uh, and have a good spring break. All right. Good night. Take care. <laughs>